Let me try it again. Hi, everybody. Um, tonight we have a joint meeting of the City Council Committees on City Services and Community Resources. And we'd like to welcome the Division of Community Care for coming to speak tonight. Um, Laura, could you take the roll call for the community resources first? Sure. Councillor Clemmer. Here. Councillor Perry. Here. Councillor Dubbs. Here. And Councillor Rothenberg. Here. Uh, thank you. Could you take the roll call for city services now? Sure. Um, Councillor Moulton. Here. Councillor Labarge. Here. And Councillor Dubbs. Here. And Councillor Rothenberg. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a quorum for both groups tonight. Um, and this is uh, speakers go up a little louder. Um, I don't know how to control the I don't either. on the speakers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, this meeting is being audio and vis video recorded. Um, and uh, is there any public comments now? Okay, well, so we'll move on. Um, and then the minutes from the previous meeting from February 20th, 2024. Um, so just we'll vote on each other separately, I guess. We'll be doing both Take together. it as a group if cool. someone chooses. Okay, so we'll take it as a group. Um, February 20th, 2024, and March 18th, 2024 for Community Resources Committee minutes. Um, I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second that. So uh, motion to approve by Councillor Perry and motion seconded by Councillor Dubbs. Um, you roll call? Yeah, give you a roll call, please. Okay. Um, so these are just community resources. Councillor Clemmer? Here. Council yes. Councillor Perry? Yes. Councillor Dubbs? Yes. Councillor Rothenberg? Yes. Okay. Um, any updates or announcements from committee members? Okay, well, I have one. Um, Repres Representative Sabadosa is going to be at our next meeting on Monday, May 20th at 5.30. And uh, being that there's nothing else, we'll now move to um, the people that came to talk to us tonight. Um, update on Department of Community Care from the Department of Health and Human Resources. And I'd like to welcome... Um, Director Christian Rhodes, and um, congratulations on your one-year anniversary working there, and Commissioner Michelle Ferry, and uh, we have Jennifer Whitehall of UMass um, speaking today. So uh, do you all want to start? Sure. Thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Michelle Fari. I'm Deputy Commissioner of the City of Northampton's um, Department of Health and Human Services, and I have the pleasure to uh, come here this evening to talk with you about our Division of Community Care. Um, and I'm very excited to be here with my colleague, uh, Director Kristen Rhodes, and um, our UMass Center for Program Evaluation um, uh, Professor Jennifer Whitehill um, to discuss some of the work that we've been accomplishing um, in this past year. So I was going to share my screen and a presentation, if that's okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. All right. So um, we put together a presentation for you this evening, and we're going to give you some updates. There was a lot of information that we we're hoping to pack into um, this brief period of time, and we're very much looking forward to getting through as much as we can. Um, one of the things that I just wanted to make this group aware of is at the end of the municipal year, we'll be providing a year one report, which will have a lot more level of detail, as well as um, a lot of the different contextualizations of the um, different uh, consultants and experts that helped us um, develop the program in this work. So this is kind of a high level overview of the updates on the DCC. Um, so this evening um, in thinking about um, the DCC, I just wanted to kind of ground us all on the social, social drivers of health. Um, the social drivers of health, often also referred to as the social determinants of health, 
are the impacts that our community can feel at any given time um, where we know that it can intersect on outcomes that they may experience related to their health and wellness. And in the DCC's perspective, what might be an urgent, um, imminent, or um, emergency type need. Uh, what we know about the community of Northampton is we're a very resilient community. We have um, a lot of resources that we are able to access, but we do not have all the solutions in the city. So many of the intersections that people experience that may impact their health and wellness um, require us to be very um, nimble, flexible, and resourceful ourselves and finding ways that we can manage capacity and demand on the system and the many different needs that people might have. Um, and we'll talk some about that in the impacts where people show in the emergency system and the urgent and imminent needs that they have daily, um, where these intersections with the social drivers of health occur. In Northampton, I'm just going to ground us all because um, some of us uh, are new here in the room today, and I'm excited to meet some of our new counselors this evening um, on the Northampton's emergency response system so that we all have a good baseline of what's accessible to people at any given time. Um, we have our fire and EMS response. We also have our police response. And within the police department, we have a co-response, which is a clinician that goes out um, with a police officer and is trained to help with certain types of calls. We have the division of community care. And then we also have behavioral health agency led crisis evaluation responses. Those responses can happen um, in the hospital setting, they can happen at the behavioral health setting, and they can also happen at the DCC, which we have been um, successful as having crisis evaluations at the DCC itself. The way that emergencies uh, present themselves within the city can happen through people calling 911. They can self-present um, at the hospital or the emergency department, um, as well as the police department. They can walk into the lobby and request support. And then at the DCC, we have the opportunity for people to self-present with a telephone number that is as well textable. We have an email, and then we have a walk-in community space. Um, and people have truly utilized um, the access to the DCC, which we'll be talking about in a little bit here, on uh, self-initiating or self-presenting and not utilizing the 911 system to request support for emergencies. We also have a hotline that's available for all the communities in Massachusetts for 988, which helps um, when people are feeling uh, suicidal ideation or crisis-like needs and many other agencies that are available for emergency or um, walk-in type support in the social service sector. We learned a lot when we were developing the DCC and some of this we've talked about in the past, but I'm going ahead and just baseline us a little bit again around gathering community voices for um, why people um, may or may not utilize the 911 system. Some folks um, here in Northampton and in many communities, these things do hold true, um, may have um, fear of unknowns when calling 911. Um, they may have had justice involvement in the past um, and trauma that may make them less likely to reach out for support in the time of an emergency. People are very private and sometimes don't want their information to be included within the 911 system. And we know that sometimes our most vulnerable populations might not even have access to a telephone on their person to be able to call 911 for themselves. And generally speaking, I think that in the state of an emergency level need, there are a lot of unknowns on what might occur or what type of service um, might inevitably be the outcome for when an emergency is occurring um, based on the way um, vulnerabilities can have impacted people and their perception and trust and fear. Also at the emergency department, we know that when people may uh, present for services and support, whether it's through the 911 system um, or on their own, they may believe through past experience that the emergency department doesn't have the types of resources that they might need or needs may have not um, been met in the past. Uh, we know that our system itself is facing incredible capacity and demand, so wait times can be very extenuating. 
And sometimes from our community members that we were able to gather information from during our community listening sessions, we learned that um, people may have had negative experiences in the past where they could have experienced stigma or bias or felt that their um, health-related needs um, were not addressed. So um, like all systems of care right now, our um, capacity is at the limit and often the experiences that people have um, may not be optimal and their trust or likelihood to call 911. This is a slide that I brought to you all here tonight um, because it is really relevant um, that across the state of Massachusetts um, and what has been conducted by the Massachusetts Healthcare Policy Commission, which was a legislative act um, in Massachusetts to assess capacity and burden and care likelihood and outcomes. Um, through policymakers that have been looking very critically at these needs since COVID and, um, and forward, um, that we know that people are accessing care in a variety of different ways, but notably in the commission's report that came out in February, um, they made a point to highlight how frequently people are accessing emergency services as self-presenting to the emergency department as what they consider a walk-in. And a walk-in could be um, taking a ride chair, um, having a friend, family member bring you directly, you yourself driving, depending on your uh, medical state and ability um, uh, to navigate driving in an emergency, um, and as well, um, walking in, self-presenting, taking the bus. Uh, there is a very vast majority of people that are accessing care related to their health, which often can be mental, behavioral, and physical health, um, as well as a belief that access to additional resources might be able to be um, made or connections of care through the emergency department at 75% of that ratio. So I'm just putting that in perspective for everyone here to understand that there is a very significant um, population and individuals that access emergency services without utilizing the 911 system. And there's a lot of background and context for this. And I recommend highly um, that our counselors consider um, going back when we provide these slides to you and watching the short, um, about an hour and a half YouTube video that really lays the landscape of the workforce shortages around the healthcare system, the capacity, demand, and experiences and outcomes people are having, and where that may result in the intersection of the division of community care and how people um, have needs that may be going unmet. There's a lot of benefits to the city of Northampton's innovation and in creating the division of community care and situating it within the public health landscape that we believe has been not only a new novel model within the state and nationally, but really prove as a person-centered trauma-informed approach to serving all people. And I wanna be very clear to reiterate that all people. Um, we certainly know that our community members who may have been uh, marginalized and are most vulnerable and oftentimes we're aware of as a community that we want to support and need the resources that have needs going unmet and risks and um, associated negative health and wellness outcomes. But the benefits of uh, contrasting that with being very inclusive to all of our community, that means that anyone um, can be served and has been um, and will be served in the future by the Division of Community Care. And we want to encourage, especially in these public spaces, to be clear that the DCC serves all people. What we have found um, through some of the benefits of um, the Division of Community Care is a lot of potential for us to look at cost reductions within the healthcare system itself and costs and burdens on the capacity and negative outcomes in the benefit of the health and wellness of our community at large. And what that can look like in uh, referencing my previous slide is simply an ambulance ride itself can be thousands of dollars and can be very burdensome on the system, especially the timeliness of responses for especially high risk medical needs and where the DCC can prove as a valuable intersection in building capacity and um, saving costs for overall the city and the systems of care themselves.
Um, one of the things that we did find in doing our invest investigatory work, if that's the right way to say it, um, but our um, examining of the system was looking at Massachusetts and federal regulations and liability risks associated with these types of programs. Um, during the development year and as we launched in September, we wanted to be very clear what the appropriate role of the DCC was and making sure that we were um, thinking very critically about how we offered care to people and making sure that we were providing safety as well as ensuring safety in the roles for our staff and the community at large. And it was notable that the Law Enforcement Action Partnership was able to find and do an extensive review of um, case law that there are little to no incidences of um, harm and safety um, when community responders are involved in calls that are appropriate for them to be on. Um, and things that we know are um, very comforting sometimes is the amount of time and de-escalation, the skills and the methodologies that our community responder and Northampton program embodies and um, Director Rhodes will be talking a little bit more um, really engage people on a variety of different levels, as well as assessing and being willing to uh, call and very much um, monitoring situations as we're responding to them to elevate to additional appropriate levels of care where needed. Um, so if that requires us calling an ambulance for medical need that is not within our purview, as well as police for safety risks and any enforcement related activities. I wanted to provide you with um, tonight, given that there was so much information to cover, um, a spatial analysis of the snapshot of the 2022 um, LEAP assessment of the Northampton 911 call data. Um, in a uh, previous year presentation to City Council, we had talked about us getting underway and starting to begin the LEAP data assessment. And after working with Chief Casper and thinking really critically about pre-COVID, COVID and post-COVID calls, what would be the most appropriate um, identifying way and map to non-COVID times now um, for DCC's call types, call volume and system needs? Um, what we can tell you is that there were uh, 5,164 calls in 2022, which is the year we settled on doing our very thorough and robust data analysis. And of those calls, um, this is a dominant um, spatial analysis of the location where community responder call types would be most, most relevant for us to respond to. Um, notably, you can see that here on the left-hand um, spatial analysis heat map, we have found that a dominant amount of the call types, which were deemed to be appropriate for the DCC responses, can be found adjacent to the downtown area. Um, and this on the right-hand side is a heat map, which shows different kinds of codings of where the calls are in concentration of those calls. So overall, of the calls that were assessed to be possibly appropriate for DCC in the future, this was the location and areas that were most identified as being appropriate uses of DCC um, service delivery. There were a lot of different reasons that calls were eliminated um, when being considered as potentially a good call for the Division of Community Care and planning and starting to anticipate um, how we would respond and what we would respond to. Um, this is criteria that um, here in this upper category of the slide are reasons that the DCC would not be an appropriate response. So these are eliminating disqualifier criteria. I felt that it was more important to be very clear what was a disqualifier because there were many qualifiers um, that we were very happy to be able to build our skills and train um, towards the variety of reasons that people call 911. But of the most important and critical things for us to be able to be very clear on when and if a call is referred to us or um, self-presents to the DCC, um, reasons that we would not be the appropriate um, emergency response. It was also kind of a highlight that I thought would be important to mention on the perceptions of embedding and integrating of community responder type programs 
to really think critically about what can be the cause and effect on 911 calls. And I think in most uh, perceptions, we might believe that instilling a valuable um, service like a community responder into the emergency services um, 911 call uh, taker um, and response um, assignments, that we would see calls potentially drop. And in reality, across the country, what has happened is in many cases, call volumes actually increase. And that can level off and it can taper over a period of time, but because these programs are so new and because there are so many um, efforts made to build trust and buy-in and appropriately respond to calls through the different kinds of triaging in the 911 system, it's more common for calls to go up as people seek to have community responders or another option in responding to 911 calls. So I just thought that might be important piece of information for us all. I'm gonna hand it over to Director Rhodes for a few minutes so that she can talk a little bit about what the community responders are doing. Thank you. Um, so I'm Kristen, um, I am the DCC Director um, and thank you for having us here today. I really appreciate this opportunity to share about the work we've been doing um, over the past few months since we opened our doors in September. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is, um, and Michelle mentioned it briefly, you know, how folks are able to reach us at the DCC. Um, and we really wanted to eliminate barriers for folks. So we wanted to think about all the possible ways that someone might feel comfortable getting to us, because that's our goal, is if someone's having a difficult moment or in need of our support or wanting to connect with us, that we realize that different people are comfortable doing different things. We wanted to have as many options for folks as possible. So folks can reach us either through um, walking into our DCC space during our community space hours. They can reach us by a phone call to our DCC phone line through texting our phone line, um, which is available. Folks can text in at any time and we do receive that so we can respond back the next morning. Um, or through an email. Um, and so what we want to do is have that initial engagement happen in a way that feels um, really comfortable for folks. And we can use that engagement um, for a while. Um, if someone is only comfortable texting initially until they get enough information to have a phone call or to come and meet with us or have us go out to them, that's okay. We can utilize that process as long as they need um, to gain the support that they're looking for. And that's part of our person-centered approach. And it starts right there um, at the initial contact. And really, you know, person-centered is used a lot right now um, in many fields. And so I wanted to talk a little bit what that means at DCC. Um, and so there's a couple components to our person-centered approach. One is that when we are initiating a response, um, we have a responder for each individual. So if someone is going to a response where there are multiple people involved, or if there are multiple entities involved, we'll assign a responder for each person. So they can really be thinking about that person's perspective and information. And it's not one responder trying to navigate two parts of a conversation. We're there to support the individual and that's why we're responding. And when we go, what we're seeking is to first deal with any imminent situation or emergency situation and to really identify immediate needs. Um, whether that is in a, a resource need, um, whether that is, as Michelle said, um, helping to connect someone to a higher level of care if we're not the appropriate response, or just to be there with the person if they're having a really difficult moment until they're back to their baseline so we can help support them in identifying other needs. And we really work to um, build our relationship with the individual. So whether it's a short time that we're with them, some folks we, you know, will provide a response to and, and it's a one-time thing. They come in, they know what they're looking for, they have their ask or they, they're really quickly able to communicate with us 
um, what their situation is. And we're able to have a short term relationship building of truly understanding what they're looking for so we can connect them to the proper resource. Or it's a more long term situation where we're continuing to build a relationship and getting to know the individual to really identify what the underlying needs could be that brought them to that place of that immediate or imminent or emergency um, need when we first met them. Um, we do voluntary care and con consent practices. So we are never, um, we're not enforcement, we're, you know, we're, we're there to support. So everything is coming from the individual that is um, presenting to us. Um, we're there to have conversation, to give information, um, and to give options, but everything is um, at the discretion and really with the lead of the person that we're supporting. We do not ask folks to, um, to share personal information unless they're comfortable. Um, what you might hear us say is, what would you like us to call you? Or what pronouns would you like us to use today? Um, but we're never asking for an ID or insurance card or anything like that um, to get our services. Um, we're really, um, our goal in understanding the individuals that we're serving is so that when we are doing the next step of our work, which is really connection to the resources within our community, we have a true understanding of what that person needs to successfully utilize those resources. Oftentimes the people that we um, see frequently have utilized resources or community resources many times and have been unsuccessful. And that's really why they're coming to us because they're not sure what to do next or what to do in that moment. Um, and so what we found is if we are able to take the time to build the relationship and really understand them, and then on the flip side, spend the time to really truly understand the resources within our community and not just what they are doing, but how they are doing it, their capacity, their intake process, all those pieces, we're able to help foster that really warm direct handoff to the resource that that person needs in a way that will help them be successful. So that could look like a phone call with a person helping them through the intake process. That could look like going with someone to the initial appointment and sitting with them to be either just a support or to be helping provide information if that's what the person is looking for. Um, and it can also mean having a conversation with the resource that we're referring to prior to that initial intake happening. We don't do a formal intake or assessment because we know that is really hard for some people that we are supporting. And so we really keep our um, interactions um, really low barrier conversation, relationship building so that um, but we can help people get through that formal assessment process that needs to happen for them to access a lot of services. And sometimes having an initial conversation with those services to talk about either accommodations or modifications to their intake process has allowed some folks who haven't been able to get through that process in the past through it um, so they can utilize the resource. We aren't case managers, um, but we do frequently have follow-up visits and with folks. And um, it's not, there's no mandatory part of interacting with DCC. So, um, you know, for some folks, they might come in with this immediate need and then they're, they're kind of finding other things that um, they could use support in. And oftentimes it could be, you know, we'll talk about this a little more, but it could be assistance with, um, applications, or it could be assistance with making appointments for other social service agencies. Um, and those things can take time. One, because sometimes it can feel like so much to do in, in one day. And a lot of the folks we serve have um, certain capacities and thresholds that they reach in a day. And we learn that about people. So we know that sometimes we have to do a task analysis and break things down into little pieces and really just focus on this little piece first. And then the next time we'll work on the next little piece to help them get to their, their goals um, in connecting to who they need to connect to, to get their support. And we also really want to continue building and having a relationship with folks so that further on down the road, even if they're utilizing the resources and they're tied into the right spots, um, 
if there's if they're having another difficult moment they still have that relationship with us so they can still come back and be like well this is happening right now i'm feeling uncomfortable about this and we can help navigate that situation in that moment before it becomes another escalated moment for them um, or another really difficult moment for them um, and i think i touched on all oh, that is michelle so i think we can go to the next slide um, so when we were um, starting out in our initial DCC training this past summer, um, you know, we had amazing trainings scheduled for our responders based on the information that we gathered and the data that was collected um, through our public listening sessions, through our key informant interviews, and by the ask of the city um, for what DCC would be doing. And we, we made our kind of our best guess on what that training should look like. And then we opened our doors in September and um, the community showed us what they were gonna be asking us for. And so we, we were able to in this, um, we have a new cohort of responders that came on recently and we were able to really think about um, our training and what worked and what went really well and what components we wanted to keep and what things we needed to add and change um, and pivot. And so we um, just completed um, a nine week training session for our um, newest group of community responders. And um, this training was both um, in-house trainings. Um, one of our community responders, um, Carlos McBride, helped design and he facilitated these trainings. Um, and, and then we also brought in some of the folks that we had worked with in the past and some new folks to provide training for our responders. So um, we still had community 911 coming in for the emergency metal medical response course, um, which provides essential skills for responding to medical emergencies in the community. And these are really low level. So we're not responding to medical emergencies. Um, I kind of say it is, um, as you'd expect like a camp counselor to respond to something medical, that would be a similar thing that we might provide. So if we're going out there, we might be, if we're the first person there, it's something we can do until the right level of medical care arrives to the scene and we can kind of hold things over until um, they arrive if we happen to be there first or we can provide really basic first aid, take blood pressures, um, that type of thing for folks. Um, and then we have um, Growing a New Heart. And this was one of the groups that we did use in both trainings. Um, and they have been phenomenal working with us to really um, shift their training to, to really focus around what we needed as DCC. So the first time we utilized some of their trainings as is, and the second time we were able to work closely with them to think about the components that really connected to the work that we are doing. Um, and so that included, you know, a lot of work around dialogues across difference, having difficult conversations, um, navigating conflict, um, and um, having conflict resolution conversations across different populations. Um, so we did a number of trainings with them again, and um, it was really wonderful to collaborate with them in designing the content of the trainings. Um, we worked with Wildflower Alliance again, both times, um, and we did their hearing voices training and their when conversations turned to suicide trainings again, this time around. Um, they have been a really great partner, both as um, a resource that we can refer folks to and to come in and do our training. Um, so they, our partnership with them is in multiple ways. Um, we've worked with um, individuals to come in and provide training. So um, Trevor Dayton, who is from Northampton Recovery Center, um, did a recovery coaching principles and philosophies training. Um, we also worked with Stephen Murray on immediate response training um, and really seen safety and different scenarios that responders might come across and how to really look at the entire scene and what's going on in that moment to make sure that they are safe and the folks that we're serving the, 
are safe. Um, and also Stephen worked with us on talking about a lot like when that next level of care is needed. That's part of his expertise and really understanding that. So he did a lot of training with our responders around that. Um, we also had harm reduction training from Jess Tilly and John Zabel, um, talking about not only um, what harm reductionists do and how to refer to harm reductionists, but also talking about how harm reduction has changed recently and what the landscape of harm reduction looks like um, in our area, as well as kind of across New England and what things that our responders need to know um, around the substances that are now out in the um, in the area so that we can help inform folks about what is out there. Um, we were able to have um, another two trainings um, from, sorry, my screen just froze, um, from Bliss. Can you still hear me? Is everything okay? Okay, great. I saw Michelle move, so I'm good. Um, from Bliss, and that was on immediate response and imminent response as a community responder. So um, Bren, Ben Brubaker um, is from Cahoots, um, and he worked as a crisis responder for over 15 years, I believe, in Cahoots, both in administration and as a responder. Um, and Rashawn Bliss um, is um, the principal member of Bliss Corporation Collaborations, um, which Ben is also a part of. And um, he was key in um, the community-led organizing of Denver Star. Um, and so they have done a number of trainings for our responders. And again, similarly to Stephen Murray, it's really about those um, real life scenario trainings that they work on and really about understanding the lane and role of the community responder and when to hand it off into a different level of care um, and how to really um, assess those situations when you're coming onto a scene. Um, so in addition to that, we did um, resource trainings, a lot of resource trainings, because that's a, a large role of the work we do, is being that connective piece to the local community resources. And so we really need to understand um, those resources. And so um, housing, we'll talk, again, we'll, this is going to come up in another slide, but housing is something that we are frequently working on folks who do not have um, housing or are looking to move indoors or are knowing that they are going to be in need of housing very, very soon. And so we've done a lot of training with our staff around that because it's really difficult um, to get appointments with housing navigators. They're often booked and the timeline often doesn't align. And so it's a really important piece of the work for some of our responders to understand um, the housing applications and how to um, support folks in filling those out and submitting them. Um, we've done work or we've done trainings on report writing and confidentiality and um, on outreach and engagement. So we have done a lot of in-house training on both collaborative problem solving, de-escalation, outreach and engagement. Um, and that is because, you know, we, we did have other folks come in and do that training in the past. But what we found is because of the really specific role of community responders and because we really are, um, that is kind of our primary purpose is that that outreach and engagement piece that we needed to modify those trainings um, in order to really represent the work that our folks are going to be seeing. So we spent a lot of time on designing our own training that really is um, specific to what we are seeing out in our community and responding to that appropriately. So our um, activity, I'm just pulling up the, um, right now. So we opened our doors on September 5th. Um, and as of, I think these numbers are about a week ago, um, we have had, um, 1,393 contacts, and we've served 438 individuals. Um, so we have had a lot of folks, um, what that means is we've had a lot of folks who we've seen more than one time and, and who our engagements um, 
include follow-ups or ongoing appointments in order to help folks get to the point where they're ready to um, move on to the resources that we're connecting them to. And the top DCC services we're providing, as I mentioned, are, are housing shelter navigation. And, and that is absolutely um, one of our primary um, pieces of service that we're providing. And even, and it's not always that someone's coming in and saying, I need housing, but often when we are um, doing an immediate response or an urgent response, that's what that response leads to, that it's someone that is in need of a place to go um, for that night. And right now it's, it's very, very tricky. Shelters are full, housing is very difficult to get. Um, and so what we, one of the things we really trained on is, is how responders can work through an unresolved engagement, because oftentimes um, we're not always able to provide an immediate solution for housing, and that's really hard. Um, so that is something that our responders have spent a significant amount of time understanding the landscape of. We have connections all through Western Massachusetts. We've been moving on further in some situations um, to really know every day what the shelter situation looks like, what the opportunities are. Um, and even if there are shelter openings, which often there are, that doesn't necessarily mean the person that we're supporting is able to utilize a shelter. Um, and I think that's a really important component. Um, some folks just aren't able to um, use that resource in that way in the in the group shelter setting. And so then we have to look to other opportunities um, for housing or shelter for some, some folks. Um, Another one of our services that we provide often is wellness checks. Um, and this can look like a community member calling and saying that, you know, we've had folks who are saying that someone is house sitting and they haven't heard from them and they're feeling worried about that. We've had wellness checks um, from folks who have been a third party caller who are downtown and they're feeling worried about someone that they've seen downtown wondering if they're needing food or drink or if they're sleeping. Um, so we often do wellness checks, which can lead to, again, moving to that next level of care, um, depending on what we see when we arrive. Um, but we will do the initial check on folks, as long as nothing we hear in the call makes us think that it immediately needs to move on to the higher level of care. Um, community resource navigation is what we want to get to with every single engagement we have. Um, we want to make sure that folks um, are able to successfully utilize um, the resources that are out there for them in the community. Um, and we work really closely with our community partners um, in doing a lot of this work. We're often working um, with the same folks. And so we, we're gonna talk a little bit about consent forms um, in an upcoming slide, but we really, um, it really helps when we're able to communicate with each other to provide the best support for folks and to know um, what supports our community partners need us to do to fill gaps that they're seeing um, when they're providing services to folks or what we can do to connect them to an additional resource that where there's a gap. Um, we also do interpersonal conflict support and that might happen in front of us when we're out on engagements. That might happen, um, folks come into the community space and just need to talk about conflict that is going on in their life and they need someone to listen. And again, can, often that leads to a connection to a resource for their specific situation. Um, and sometimes we will, you know, go out in the moment to, to help with the conflict that's going on in the community. As I said earlier, um, for us, it's really important to have two responders for these situations um, because we are really there when we see any um, rise or any um, really behavior, we really want to get to like the root of that and really truly understand what's under that and what happened prior and 
be able to support those pieces and put in levels of support for folks um, through different resources. And it, we found that it really benefits us to not be the person who's necessarily fixing that one problem, but really getting to the underlying pieces and needs of support to connect folks to what they need by having a responder for each individual and truly building a relationship with each individual, even again, if it's a short-term one-time meeting relationship. Um, we do a lot of work with mental health support. A lot of the folks that are coming to us, frequently frequent utilizers of the DCC um, really do have a lot of different mental health components um, that add to their stressors. And so building relationships with those folks and kind of understanding their baseline and understanding their way of communicating and um, then again, connecting them to the right resource, not just a resource is a lot of our work. And when there's an additional mental health component that takes more time because we really, um, for some folks, those are the people who come back and say, I've used everything and um, it doesn't work for me. And we wanna understand the why so we can help support that and bridge that gap for the next time that they're utilizing the resource. And we've been able to do that. There have been some situations where folks have come in adamant that they the resources um, aren't right for them and they don't want to, they, they've lost trust in some resources. And we, because of our relationship with the resources, have been able to even bring folks from that resource to the space at the DCC where they're feeling comfortable and rebuild that relationship. So then that relationship can move back um, to the resource. Um, and emergency public safety needs. So we are, um, always willing and happy to provide additional support in any situation that's going on in the city, even if we're not that immediate response. If there's another um, public safety entity that is responding, we are, um, we've been connected to folks who we can then connect with after for follow-up. We, one really important role that we do is um, prevention work. So if we know that someone is a high utilizer or frequent utilizer of the 911 system, and we've had those conversations and we know who they are, we preemptively go in to have um, engagements with folks prior to um, when they might frequently have a call to 911 place. So if we know that someone is getting um, a lot of 911 calls from third party callers at in the afternoon. Um, we might go and visit them, you know, at 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, have an engagement, see if there's any resources they need or just connect to really try to keep them at baseline so that they don't get to that point where that phone call is coming in. Um, so these are our connections. And like I talked about, um, you know, there are multiple ways to come in and connect with us. Um, we often have, walk-ins has been by far um, the most frequently used way to access us, um, which is not what we anticipated. We were really surprised by this, um, but folks um, come in either with a community resource partner who's bringing them to us. They come in with other folks who have engaged with us in the past, or sometimes they just stumble across our building and they're like, oh, actually this is, you know, this would be helpful. Um, we also have a lot of folks that we will go out and when we're doing engagements or we've gotten a phone call or a referral in and we go out, they come back to the space to have more time in a private area to meet with responders. Um, so that can happen quite often where it might be that the initial phone call was um, how they utilized us, but then they come back and they do walk-ins after that. So that that is actually a, a frequent presentation of, of what we see. Um, and we also have gotten dispatch referrals where dispatch calls our direct DCC line um, to ask us to respond to a call that they received that they've deemed appropriate for us. And these are some of the um, 
types of calls that um, we feel like are initial dispatch call types for the DCC. Um, and so some of these are what we have, all of these are what we have already gotten um, sent to us through dispatch. So oftentimes it is a wellness check um, on someone, especially when there's a mental health or a thought that there might be a mental health component to it. So we get calls about folks lying down in public spaces or folks yelling in public spaces. Um, someone who might be um, lying down where folks aren't unsure if they're sleeping or if they're in need of support. Um, we also can do um, conflict resolution, especially between sh in shared spaces. So oftentimes we might have um, a business or someone who's in a business calling with concern about someone who's utilizing a shared space in a way that it's not intended. And so the DCC can come in and help um, provide support for someone based on what they're looking for. And what that might look like is we, um, you know, offer, again, resources, a place to go. We might, you know, if someone's resting and MANA's open, we might say, can we help you get to MANA? Or, um, you know, if someone's on the really hot days, we would bring water. If someone was lying down, they might have just needed a drink to hydrate um, before they could move on from that space. Um, and we also have been able to go in um, and we have been called in when there is um, a trespass order that is going to be um, presented. So we're able to go in prior to that and again, offer support, see what that person's looking for, what kind of housing we might be able or shelters we might be able to connect them to and see if they want to utilize our services, knowing that that um, is something that will happen if they continue staying in that space. So our consent practices. Um, so we do have um, a consent form that we offer to folks to fill out, especially if they're utilizing a lot of resources um, in the area. So we can have shared conversations or if they're trying to access a resource, we'll ask them to complete it so we can help facilitate that if that's something that they're looking for. And we really want to support individuals to the level that they need and want. Um, we, Part of our work is to know when to back off, especially if we're working with someone for a long time and helping to make that connection, warm handoff and back away. And having that consent form in place really allows us, as I said earlier, to um, really sh be able to have those conversations about what supports or modifications or accommodations might be needed for them to utilize um, those programs. And I apologize if you hear my dog, she was right there in the background. <laughs> I can, I can uh, take it from here, Kristen, for a little bit. Um, so we covered a lot of information about what the community responders are doing and the modalities and some of the pieces of the work that they have been trained and we've um, really bear witness to our community engaging with the DCC on. And, and I feel like I want to just um, ground the experience of what it has been like since September. Um, we had no idea that when we opened the doors on September 5th, um, that we would um, not have to work very hard to gain community trust and buy-in with the response that we actually had, which was um, an incredible amount of people ready and willing to engage and utilize the DCC services. Uh, we pretty much, you know, the, the cliche statement is we had a line outside of the door when we unlocked um, on the first day. Um, there was a lot of notable things that we could um, take away from in those first few months as we've evolved even over the past you know, six, seven months of operations were that um, people had high expectations um, that we could manage and solve very complex and challenging emergency urgent issues that they were experiencing. Um, and whether that was a person who was self-initiating a request for support 
or whether that was a community agency partner, um, a dispatch referral, or other um, collaborative um, effort on behalf of caring for someone who um, was concerning um, to others in the community. Um, we were really um, astounded that there was buy-in from day one. There was a limited amount of um, effort that we needed to make to um, ask people to come engage. What we did find was those connections um, versus the engagements were instrumental. And I'll just distinguish the two is connections were the ongoing and regular outreach. It was the walking certain um, areas of known um, individuals of concern. It was tabling at events um, within the community that were bringing awareness to the DCC. If it was using the DCC space as an additional additional cooling or warming space, um, we would often uh, open or have opened on holidays or work closely with other neighboring partner agencies um, to make sure when, for instance, MANA was closed, we would um, make extra efforts for DCC to be open, to all think about the capacity, um, what can be a result on the emergency services system or an uptick in people's needs. Um, and it's been an amazing experience uh, working with uh, partners um, in the way that um, the community saw the value and role of the DCC and really began to utilize us in this way. We have not duplicated services. We have sought to complement and fill gaps. Um, our best, uh, as Kristen mentioned, um, approach to people with urgent and emergency type needs is to be an expert and providing the pathway and making those connections for people to prevent um, future emergencies or any additional um, or resulting harm. So in all of this piece of work, as we had a lot of ideas what the DCC would be and what it would do and what the community was asking for DCC, what we really were astounded by was the way the community um, presented and engaged. And often Kristen will describe it's almost a three-part process for us, um, what the community is asked us to do, what the community is showing up and presenting us their needs are, and what we look to continue to plan and prevent as being a public health approach. So that requires a lot of dexterity. It requires a lot of flexibility and a lot of um, dimension to the training and ability, ability for our staff to be able to shift and pivot at any given time. Um, and that's come up with us being able to help when we've had flooding in Northampton and helping to move and prepare people. It's helped us when we've had extreme heat and cold. Um, and we've worked really closely with our most vulnerable, as well as all of the partners across the city to mobilize um, and respond in a connected way. So our um, connections often can be from events, street side, it can be through outreach and engagement, and then our um, services delivered to individuals um, has been quite remarkable compared to what we've been um, told other sites across the state with similar programs have had, and we very closely um, follow and monitor um, the thresholds for how we can continue to um, evolve the services and needs, and especially in the excitement we have moving forward, um, expanding the dispatch connection and calls. I'm hesitant to take too much more time because we have an amazing opportunity to learn a lot from the assessment and evaluation that our UMass partners have here with us. Um, but I just want to mention one more piece um, that I think is important for our city leadership to be aware of. Um, the only uh, real barrier that we have learned of recently and in this process and being such a new model and a new model within public uh, health and without a um, licensed clinical approach to our work is um, advocacy that we are underway um, with partners across the state and many 
um, great minds on the even national level to overcome certain regulations that there are barriers to certain call types. The DCC um, can effectively, uh, through the regulation, respond to. And those right now fall under the call types of a medical classification where um, the emergency services um, protocol, which is a statewide protocol, not specific here to Northampton and Massachusetts as being um, a much stricter of regulations of the states across the country, but still very much on par, um, needs to have clarity with these new novel programs, um, what our limitations um, and responsibilities might be to be able to embed us within a medical call type in the 911 dispatch system. So we're working on that right now. And that's something that we really want for the DCC to be able to uh, support and work closely with our fire and EMS partners. Um, part of that is related to this regulation, which will come back out to you in the slides and is a very well established and rigorous regulation um, that exists around the limitations of what our partnership can be on medical related calls. Um, so lots more to unpack there and future conversations, but we're working to overcome some of these obstacles because it is so new. We're setting precedents and we're needing to define um, these roles within the emergency response systems. Um, and lastly, I wanted to tell you all about an amazing new opportunity um, that the DHHS is utilizing to leverage our resources and ability to extend our work with UMass. Um, as well as the UMass uh, Medical Chan School and the PERCH um, program, which is providing um, for uh, students that are on the journey to become um, doctors that are going to be working with us over four years to help um, improve and enhance um, the various different uh, programs that DHHS intersects with the DCC in our public health nursing and our prevention division. And there's lots to come with that, um, but we're very excited to welcome um, four students dedicated to working on this journey with us, along with the UMass Center for Program Evaluation. Um, so I have lots of other uh, feedback and thoughts. And again, this was a lot to pack into a conversation on a year's worth of work and much to um, explore in detail. But I'm going to hand it over to um, Jennifer Whitehill to talk a little bit about the assessment and evaluation um, rigors for DCC. Thanks, Michelle. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, tell me that look right to folks. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'm Jen Whitehill. I am a faculty member at UMass Amherst and a member of the UMass Center for Program Evaluation. And we have had the pleasure of working with the DCC uh, to uh, set up and um, conduct evaluation activities for the um, excellent work that they are doing and building. Just make sure this slide goes forward. Oh, it doesn't want to change. All right, it's a little delayed, sorry about that. Um, so I'm <clears throat> gonna try and keep this concise so that there is time for questions from, from the group. I'll quickly introduce um, the Center for Program Evaluation, describe our approach to the DCC evaluation project, I'll share with you uh, what we consider to be some baseline and sort of very early findings. Um, as Michelle mentioned, we're excited about providing sort of a more full um, year one report um, a little bit down the road. So what you hear today will just be the sort of tip of the iceberg. Um, what I'll talk about involves two different approaches that we took to some data collection, some quantitative data collection uh, through a survey that was conducted in Northampton and also some qualitative interviews. Um, then I'll talk about uh, our next steps and um, hopefully time will allow us to share a few of the case studies um, for some uh, specifics uh, that we've been pulling out of the DCC's client records and um, and I'll wrap it up with a few sort of key insights. Um, the UMass CPE, our role is um, a group of researchers who work collaboratively with different programs to develop evaluation designs that meet their goals. 
And we help um, the DCC and other entities gather the data that's designed to inform the improvement of their processes and practices. And that happens at a lot of different points in a program's life cycle. And what I'm really happy about in this case is that we've been brought on early enough in this project that we can really um, gather the kind of baseline and early information that would allow assessment of how it's going for the DCC down the road. That is not as common as we would like it to be in terms of being able to use rigorous methods to understand how a program is working and why. So this is our team from the um, CPE who is involved in this project. We bring a bunch of different kinds of expertise to the table from um, my own background in um, injury prevention research and uh, drug policy to um, epidemiology and mental health. Um, and so, you know, you might recognize some of these folks from being um, around town. Uh, so I want to highlight that one of the strengths of um, the work that we're doing with the DCC is that we're using a mixed methods research approach. And that allows us to both gather quantitative numerical information, you know, counting things. Michelle um, uh, and Kristen shared some numbers with you about, you know, the nature of different DCC contacts and what's being done. Um, we supplement that kind of information with a survey of the community asking people about um, perceptions and experiences. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. We also can extract information from the records, again, to quantify um, what is what the DC is doing and to look down the road. Now we're doing sort of baseline work in this area to look at trends in terms of the kinds of services and the outcomes that the DCC is achieving. We also really importantly supplement um, this uh, quantitative research with qualitative research where we gather um, context and perceptions through open-ended conversations or analysis of text. Um, and so that um, really allows us to sort of holistically look at the um, uh, picture of what the DCC is doing, what's working, what are challenge areas. And, um, you know, in this case, we've had numerous Northampton community members, public officials, individuals working in local human service agencies participate with us in one of these kinds of um, research and evaluation endeavors that we've conducted. So I also at this point just want to say a really big thank you to anybody who took the time from the community to share their thoughts and perceptions with us, either through a survey or perhaps through an individual interview, um, that uh, we're grateful for that. It allows us to share these findings back today. So first I'll talk a little bit about the Northampton Community Survey. Maybe this flyer looks familiar to you. It was posted um, all around town. Uh, the purpose of this survey was to identify community priorities relevant to the DCC's work and um, learn a little bit about the baseline awareness of the DCC conducted um, before the DCC's formal launch. So again, this real strength in having what I'd consider that baseline information. We um, conducted this survey using um, two recruitment approaches. One was what we um, you know, what you might have encountered as an online survey, you know, um, a link sent out to various groups. Uh, we also conducted street intercept recruitment where um, uh, folks from our team were posted up around town um, asking people for a few minutes of their time to participate in a conversation. And um, the, again, this all happened for the few months from June through September prior to launch. We wanted to make sure that we could also gather this information in both English and Spanish so that um, uh, there would be uh, not a barrier for Spanish speakers to participating. Um, the eligibility for doing this, so when I present results, it's important for um, you guys to understand like, well, who did we talk to? Who was eligible to participate in this? Um, we define that criteria really broadly in terms of someone who lives, works, or receives services in Northampton. So we, again, we wanted to capture a really wide swath of the population. And, um, you know, we defined services as, um, you know, 
participating in programs or facilities for the meeting of basic health, welfare, and other needs. Um, and so we've put up these flyers at heavily trafficked areas in the, com in the community in hopes that um, some folks would uh, see our QR code, scan it, um, and go ahead to complete the survey uh, separately from those folks who were actually approached directly on the street. Um, what, uh, what we did um, for the sampling method here, we'd call it a quasi-random sample uh, for selecting participants on the street. You can sort of enhance the rigor of any data collection um, by trying to get some um, variety in terms of who you approach. And um, the online survey um, that was distributed through QR codes, we consider that more of a convenient sample of people who we were able to get who did actually use the code or respond to a link that was emailed to them. Overall, um, the reason for doing it this way was that we wanted to make sure to engage the populations who might be less likely to participate in an online survey. That requires a certain degree of access um, that not everybody has, but we felt that was really important. Um, the uh, street intercept survey was conducted on um, tablets and uh, sort of handed over to someone to quickly um, fill in. And um, it took about five minutes and the incentive of a $5 gift card was utilized to help people feel um, comfortable giving us their time. Um, uh, here's some information at the bottom of the slide about sort of exactly where um, and when the data collectors were out and about to gather that information. So what did we find? Um, we ended up with 475 responses. And um, you know, while that's certainly smaller than the number of people in Northampton, um, I'm proud of this because as I've scanned um, evaluation reports from other similar types of programs, like this is a really good, um, this is a really good number. And I think it um, is testament to the commitment um, to try to get a diversity of perspectives in collecting this information. Um, the balance was about, uh, not quite 50-50, but about 45% of those responses came through the street intercept approach and the rest came from the online access. Um, even before the DCC launched, over half of the people who were surveyed were already aware of the DCC. Um, and uh, we are happy to report that the sample of folks who we ended up talking to was quite diverse in terms of gender identity, race and ethnicity, as well as age, with the probably not surprising finding that there was more of a response from older age groups in the online survey and more of a response um, from younger people through Street Intercept, um, validating the sort of benefit of taking that approach. And um, in addition to that awareness piece, uh, the survey asked about comfort calling 911, as well as a number of scenarios in which people would be willing to contact uh, or would be interested in contacting their likely, they rated their likeliness of contacting an organization like the DCC. So some of the main uh, criteria or situations where someone said, um, where respondents said they would contact the DCC are listed here. Things like someone causing a public disturbance, um, someone bathing in a public restroom or fountain, sleeping on the sidewalk or outdoor space, or use of illegal substances in a public place. And I think it's really important to crosswalk that with the um, concerns about, you know, what are community members to do in these situations where something is, um, you know, they feel unhappy about it, but not necessarily wanting to call 911. Um, I'll also share information that we garnered from the qualitative key informant interviews that were really designed to evaluate um, and assess, at, again, this is all baseline, this is prior to the launch, but get the perspectives of DCC's partners around the DCC's strengths, challenges, um, potential challenges, I guess, at that point, um, opportunities, and um, we tried to capture you know, diverse perspectives of partners through that. Those interviews were conducted um, in April and May um, and involved 11 semi-structured interviews with different city officials, um, emergency services workers, um, and some important community members who are very familiar with the um, 
DCC uh, as it was being planned. Um, for that information, we conducted an interview with open-ended questions, and then we recorded, transcribed, and analyzed the text of those interviews um, using a thematic coding approach. Um, so here are some of the key themes that we mentioned. Again, we specifically asked about what are the strengths, what are the challenges, what are the um, you know, perceptions of the DCC. So um, some of the key themes related to um, the fact that interagency collaboration will be really important in order to integrate DCC into um, existing services. Uh, the respondents um, and key informant interviewees noted uh, DCC's role that really, and this really aligns with what we were hearing earlier um, as Kristen was sharing what the DCC is doing. Um, DCC's partners really felt that their role would be essential for filling gaps in services um, and providing support beyond the emergency response system. And, um, you know, community stakeholders emphasize the need for DCC to work with local emergency response and the service, the existing landscape, as we heard a lot of examples of. Um, we asked participants to tell us specifically, how will you know if it's working, right? How will you measure success? This is an important question for these kinds of programs. And you can see here, you know, some of the things that folks are hoping for. Um, decrease in calls that require a police response, decrease in police involvement in mental health crisis, crises, um, reduction in um, 911 calls from um, frequent flyers, right? As well as, you know, making those connections and to services that actually get follow-up. So these are some of the things that going forward, we will aim to um, work with the DCC to make sure that are, are being measured. Um, some of the opportunities that came up were specific around this um, continuous care and follow-up that sometimes doesn't happen in other service um, providers, right? Sort of holding someone through complex transitions, um, having the DCC as a responder was an opportunity to increase the feelings of comfort and safety for people who want to refer to or receive crisis um, response. And, um, you know, I think one of the other benefits that came up was, or opportunities was thinking about um, the DCC as situated within DHHS as really aligning with uh, public health strategies. Um, and that connects with what um, Michelle shared earlier. Of course, um, uh, and something that I really admire about the way um, the um, DCC leaders are uh, engaging with us about this evaluation is that they also wanted to hear about potential challenges because the best way to um, address uh, challenges is to know what you might face, right? And so um, some of the challenges that were raised make a lot of sense in the context of this work, things like burnout um, uh, and just team cohesion in um, this very challenging field, uh, the challenging nature of the work that DCC responders do. Other challenges included the um, challenge of just integrating with um, 911 and creating really standardized replicable workflows, um, as well as um, the challenge of uh, communication in um, a sort of shifting and changing time for the program. So these are things for DCC to keep an eye on as it continues to grow and um, go forward. Um, Next steps for our evaluation look like um, supporting ongoing data collection, analyzing client records. Um, hope, we hope to help the DCC develop a feedback process um, from the clients to actually share you know, um, what's going well. Um, and we also plan to conduct some interviews with the DCC staff. We have not talked to the um, staff of the DCC yet um, and some external advocates, with the hopes of documenting the process of what this is, because um, you know, sitting here uh, at UMass, I can easily share that um, there are lots of folks in communities all around the country who want to do something like this. And so um, trying to learn from Northampton's experience about the process, not just the outcomes, is um, an important part of turning this into sort of a model program. So, um, 
one of the things that we'll do next is this analysis of the text of DCC's case notes. And in the interest of time, I'm going to go through this very quickly. This is sort of a preview for um, work that uh, hasn't been completed yet, but I think is some of the more interesting um, uh, aspects of the project that we at CPE are excited to be undertaking. So um, what we've done is um, taken sort of anonymized case records and uh, reviewed them in a qualitative analysis fashion to try to identify themes that come up in the notes of um, the DCC staff. And so we're specifically coding the um, case notes for a couple of things, the kinds of services that are received, the client's attitudes, right, which give us some insights into the client's perception, their satisfaction with the process and their level of engagement, as well as what are the kinds of goals and milestones that the um, DCC workers are able to help people move towards. So, um, Here's one case that again, like I believe this meeting ends at six and we are awfully close to that time. So um, consider this, you know, certainly um, the beginning of a conversation, not the end of it um, with a, I'll just present a couple quick cases. So this was an example um, from the cases of an individual who presented to the DCC um, for, you know, housing related concerns. And there was many areas of need identified, um, you know. And so interestingly, in this case, the client was apprehensive and concerned about actually engaging with the DCC. Um, however, what um, over a four month long engagement, the DCC staff were actually able to um, help this individual develop the willingness to get some help except um, some, uh, you know, um, housing help as the DCC workers help this person actually secure permanent housing. That's a really big success. Um, the person also was able to make some changes in their behavior that allowed them to feel better. And in the end, um, this person actually now regularly visits the DCC uh, community space to socialize or to ask for help. And so, um, this was all clear to us through just reviewing the notes for this client that this person was moved through um, initial deep need uh, um, around housing, but also some other complexities um, and feelings fearful, right? That's something that we know can happen for vulnerable individuals concerned about engaging with any kind of um, support services all the way to getting some of what they need and um, being, you know, a member of the broader community um, that shows up at the DCC. So we were able to um, see how DCC um, leveraged community resources in this case, other resources in the community to help this person um, along. I think I'm going to also share an example of a, um, a different type of uh, interaction, a shorter interaction, again, very much um, connected to housing. Uh, this was an instance where um, someone was needing support to relocate to avoid a charge of trespassing. And in this case, you know, something like this might come in from a 911, a referral from dispatch, 911 dispatch, or from neighbors or business owners who don't want to call 911, but want um, somebody to not be in the place that they are um, spending time. And so in this case, the DCC was able to um, overcome um, initial distress about uh, the relocation and to help resolve some conflict between individuals to help people move to another location without being charged for trespassing. And so again, this, um, as a public health researcher who's very prevention oriented, you can see how these are situations that um, really prevent some um, uh, worse outcomes from occurring for people in the community. And that's one of the uh, more holistic goals that the DCC services are able to provide and that we're seeing, um, you know, we can't measure that longer term in the client notes, but we can um, understand how things lead to one thing leads to another and how um, this type of case 
has a bigger Im ring of impact other than just this individual, right? This has, has an impact in the community more broadly. So I am going to um, go ahead and um, wrap us up, uh, concluding that, you know, from our uh, quantitative survey, really, the um, community uh, demonstrates, you know, that they see a role for the DCC in helping vulnerable individuals towards stability. The DCC's partners are hopeful about the role that it can play, but do note some potential challenges that would be expected and are being addressed for this kind of work. And also that our um, preliminary review of client records indicates some important gains and outcomes for clients that really link back towards that potential community benefit um, that we uh, saw was desired in the survey um, itself. So I'll leave it there. Thank you guys so much for your time. Thank you, Jen. Um, I just wanted to wrap up with one important um, detail that I feel in this essence of time, um, trying to really think critically about what would be the most information we could map together in a presentation in an hour and a half to put, you know, the levels of detail together that has been involved in this work. And I, I cannot wait to share with you all. And we are always willing um, to meet, speak, uh, field questions in detail and specific things that our community or public might be bringing to you. But of one of the more notable findings in designing this work and understanding the need and all of the important things that the Policing Review Commission and um, many great minds of Northampton have come together to make the task of creating a division of community care not only effective at easing the um, diversity, equity, and inclusion to risk factors that made people want to engage with our services and trust our services, which we hope to continue to earn every day through every engagement, but was who were the callers dominantly that were engaging 911 services? We asked LEAP and we were the first site in the country, and I'm proud of this, and I do believe comes from some of our experience in the prevention work that we have done in the past as DHHS. Could you help us understand how the 911 call is being originated, generated of all of these calls that we hope to help um, introduce the DCC services? And dominantly what was a very astounding takeaway for themselves at LEAP as well as uh, to bring to future communities in their data analysis was it was the third party caller. It was an individual calling on behalf of someone else that had no familiar connection to, no, um, not a friend, not an ally, not a family member, um, but it was an unknown person in a third party exchange that would call 911 to ask for support, help, or um, to reduce risk, um, address fear or discomfort for someone else or a, a situation involving other individuals. And I think that is just a really important thought to ground our work in, because if we're looking at ways to reduce 911 calls and vulnerabilities and intersections with trauma and risk um, that can often involve our justice systems um, and, and future um, harm that compounds. It is really getting ahead of that third party call in the first place. So it's putting the DCC services out in the community, making them accessible to people before a 911 call even occurs. And when we know especially high risk um, are already in place for individuals routinely trying to build engagement and measures to help create safety um, for the community at large and the individuals themselves of concern. So I believe that we um, probably have made our time now, but <laughs> um, excited, so excited to get you a lot more information and detail as a follow-up from any um, interest areas that we've sparked through this conversation today. Thank you for having us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Deputy Thank you. Commissioner Ferry and um, Director Christian Rhodes and Professor Whitehall. Thank you so much for spending your time today to um, come and tell us about your very busy year and um, all you've accomplished. And we're so glad to have you in our community. And um, yeah, we look forward to hearing from you again and 
and meeting with you. Um, any comments from anybody else? Yeah, I, I also want to thank that. That was a, a very, uh, very thoughtful presentation. And uh, obviously was a lot of information uh, for not only us, but for the for the community to digest. And I, I wanted to underscore the I mean, a couple of things I heard uh, that are important when I think about the DCC are uh, how you're evaluating your success uh and and particularly uh, with uh, some some of the intangibles building trust uh for example with people who don't have anybody else to trust and i think that's uh i, th I think you're doing that uh i'm also intrigued by this uh this new internship program that you announced uh, very quickly um uh, anxious to hear more about that but i think that um i think from what you presented today, uh, that you've identified successes and continuing challenges for us to, um, you know, for us to continue to uh, to work on. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Alderman. Oh, and Councillor Uh Thank you, Michelle, um, very, very much. Um, I am just pleased knowing that we are moving forward. And I do have a question mm -hmm. because I've worked with these type of problems all my life as a supervisor. My question is, we went from quite a bit of calls and now we are decreasing calls. How many staff did we start off with? I can't remember that on open house. Was it like around seven, seven or eight? Yes, it was training. Mm -hmm. are, they, are they still there or? We have experienced about what was expected of a 70% retention rate. So it generally looks as if um, a lot of great ideas um, and uh, conceptualization of what the community responder role might look like in that first iteration in training and hiring of folks with a lot of passion and belief in our mission and values. And then the reality of something brand new and starting to do the job and time and unforeseen occurrence um, in people's lives. We are very proud um, of the retention rate that we have had with staff, as well as um, one thing, Councilor LaBarge, I'd love to, to share with you, especially is we had an overwhelming amount of applicants when we posted for the position the second time for a couple of positions that were open and a couple we had received grant funding to expand with. And um, the amount of applicants after uh, three, four months of operating really took uh, Kristen and I by surprise. The qualifications that people are putting themselves forward um, and the diversity in those applicants um, was just really incredible. And I, I did present to the Board of Health a few weeks ago just to give some updates. Um, and I, I really attribute the workforce development, the ingenuity of this community responder role and being in public health is kind of a, a multiple pathways to find a way to be a, a care worker, a care provider, um, and bring different kinds of skills forward and then add the training, the value of the training that we have put forward as a community responder. And you really have these very unique and specialized individuals um, with so many different backgrounds. So lots of our uh, staff members have licenses, licensures to do different various types of clinical supportive roles, but that's not the value that we're asking them to use. We're asking them to use all their skills. Um, and just one last piece is this wasn't part of our presentation, but one of the tasks the um, Policing Review Commission wanted was to make sure that we were valuing individuals with lived and living experience, and we are also representing the community and the diversity we put forward in our workforce. And I can really um, proudly say that that has happened um, very organically from people that want to work as part of DCC and the workforce itself. The diversity in our staff is quite incredible, and the layers of lived experience um, that they bring to this work that Sometimes uh, it's hard to close, <laughs> you know, and ask people to go home at the end of the day because you know they're they're very passionate um, 
and skilled people who often have had some of these experiences themselves in their life. I can see where the burnout would occur Mm -hmm. because you're dealing with so many different types of behaviors. Mm -hmm. It's a lot. It's a lot. Thank you very much. And you can go back and tell all your employees, we thank them for doing what they're doing. They were all excited about this presentation tonight. (laughs) Uh, Councillor Perry. Yeah, um, I just want to echo what everyone said. I'm so thankful for you guys coming to present again uh, here. I'm thankful for your work. And it's really been heartening seeing uh, your responders out in the community. I'm friends with so many responders, and it just lights my day up. I honk and wave, and I see them doing that work. Um, I I did want to say that it was nice to see that you guys got so much engagement without having to do a bunch of outreach. Um, But I had mentioned to the interim director, Sean Donovan, that um, I'm always available to help do events. And and it seems like uh, the the people we really need to reach are those third party folks. And so getting that out there. So, you know, don't hesitate to to kind of reach out to me for that. Um, But the I did have a question when you're saying having people leave. And I was wondering, how has the response been for your hours? Is there any thought of of kind of fluctuating those things or, or, you know, how, how, how are people receiving that? That is a great question. And thank you, Councillor Perry. Um, we have a few events that are planned upcoming and marketing campaigns and, and new things that we're doing um, as far as helping assist with evictions. Like other populations, we've been expanding in that emergency and first response, but also the business community. We have been starting to really more assertively um, flyer and build those relationships with our downtown business partners. Hours are tricky. Uh, We have a lot of information that we learned in the assessment from the LEAP data and from the years of experience that um, Chief Casper had brought when we really thought critically, what should those hours be? We're also trying to pair that with supervision and making sure that we had enough safety in place, um, similar to our other first responder partners, but we are planning to expand hours. I don't want to um, name exactly what those are going to be, but we're looking at potentially the days that we see the highest traffic, extending the hours into the evening, especially with the summer months coming, and adding some weekend hours is our plan. Um, We were kind of honing in exactly on what when we see that engagement spike, but we have to get through a full calendar year and the seasons to really um, know best. But that is very much the plan going into um, May as an expansion of hours. Council Dubs. Thank you. Um, I This question is actually similar to what Council Perry was just asking about. Um, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It was amazing and very informative and helpful. I was just um, to, to kind of to, uh, similar to what he was talking about. I was curious about what um, is it, like you were talking about a hotline, and I was wondering if that is something that's is it twenty four hours a day, or is it just like a only available during business hours? And then I guess I would just ask like, what would your advice be for for people who are looking for services outside of business hours, like on the weekends? And yeah, basically, thank you. Thank you for that question. I, I'm hesitating to answer uh, all these questions on behalf of Director Rhodes, but um, feel free, Kristen, to jump in. Um, so the DCC's telephone line is available for a message to be left, a text to be sent 24 hours a day. And we do have people leave messages for us and off hours. We we do a lot of hard work around preparing the community um, and, and Kristen and the team and posting if we anticipate to be closed, for instance. Um, Uh, for a training or any sort of use of the space, people rely on our services and they know our schedule quite well. Um, And then as far as our partners go, what's been really interesting about the off hours is we will get referrals sometimes from dispatch when we open on a Monday that were calls that came in over the weekend that they'd asked us to follow up on or provide some additional support and services. So, um, We've opened some holidays, um, we've opened some weather event days, um, and really just thinking critically about how we can put as many hours in community responders um, available and on the street side as possible. But the number is available to call any time. It has um, the availability for people to know what our hours are, and it's on that outgoing message. And we do monitor them, but we're very clear to say that um, we are not a 24-hour operation, so no one was to be confused and inadvertently expect a response um, when it was an off time. 
Is that make is that is that helpful? <laughs> hey, yeah, that was great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Councillor Rothenberg. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to second what you said about the lived experience and the amazing quality of your staff. One of them is a person I've known for years, and they are quite literally just made for this job and so passionate about it and so good at it. And so I can really see that you guys are knocking it out of the park with that. And I love to see that. Um, I don't want to ask you any questions you have to answer tonight. I know we're over time. Um, I just wanted to put a bug in your ear about some of the things my constituents are bringing, some of the questions, and I'll follow up with you another time about them. But a couple of the things that I'm hearing um, is a real interest in the advisory committee, Citizens Advisory Committee. And I do hear you doing so much really great work, um, listening to the community and working with the community um, and staffing yourselves with community. But I think we want to return to that uh, conversation <clears throat> and um, the funding conversation. I definitely want to get back into that. I have a lot of questions from constituents about, um, especially this in the context of the police budget. And I think that what you raised tonight about the uh, the state regulations that are sort of a, a huge barrier, that medical piece mm -hmm. is something that I look forward to coming and delving into and learning more about mm -hmm. because that's that sounds like the big, the big question there. And I, I can't wait to hear, um, I'm glad you uncovered it. I can't wait to learn more about the nuances of that. So, you know, we still, I guess what I'm trying to say is that Ward 3 still shares this commitment to um, the original, like, inception of the DCC. And while you're growing into finding kind of more things it can do and the more things people want from it, we also are still kind of looking at those really core original things that we know are so big and so aspirational and so hard to get to. And we're curious and excited to see what you'll do in another year to get one step closer. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, I welcome any counselor, any time that wants to lean in and, and uh, any way that you have an area of interest or your constituents have a point of advocacy or an ask, we really are um, grounded in the community. Ask in the values of Northampton and believe in this mission and, val and, and vision that we all share. And I do want to say it's been a little bit um, overwhelming at times, the contacts that we've received from other sites across the country, as, as well as throughout Massachusetts. We hosted the city of Cambridge and there's a group of 10 a brand new community responders that came here as another freestanding um, community response program. And, and I know some of our counselors have other commitments, so I don't want to keep mm -hmm. going here, but um, it's been really amazing how as young as we are people are reaching out often mm -hmm. asking us for advice and assistance so it's very humbling also and this public health approach requires incredible transparency and willingness to always revisit and and um, strategically plan and streamline so we are completely and thank you for that feedback um excited to talk more about help with the regulations pieces mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much. Um, anything else from anybody? Um, well, thank you so much again for your time today. And thank you, uh, Council Moulton and City Services for joining us for this meeting today. And um, if there's no other questions, we could just proceed to- I will move to adjourn community resources. Oh, what about these? Uh, I always oh, to like <laughs> real quickies. <laughs> so um, thank you so much again. Thanks for all you're doing here. Really appreciate it. Um, okay, so any items referred to, com to committee? Nope. Any new business? Nope. Okay, um, so I guess if somebody wants to move to adjourn, we can. I will move to adjourn community resources. And that was uh, Councilor Perry's moving to adjourn. Anybody second it? Second. And Councilor Lavarge will second it. Mm -hmm. um, could you do a roll call, please? Oh, uh, community but resource. Combine the two committees that way. We might have to con uh, adjourn the two separately. Yeah, like oh. last time. So, uh, could you do community resources first, please? And you get a second from another community resource. Oh, no. I'll, I'll second that. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, Councillor Clemmer. Uh, yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Dobbs. Yes. And Councillor Rothenberg. Uh,
Councilor Rothenberg left. Well, three to zero. Just to, okay. Absent. And uh, can we move to adjourn community city services now? I second. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, Council LaBarge. Council LaBarge. City Services, and I second it. Okay. Um, Councilor Moult. Yes. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Councilor Dobb. Yes. Councilor, Councilor Rothenberg. Okay. Three to zero. <laughs> <laughs>